at the moment you're talking to the crisis service at Childline. And you know you said a couple of weeks ago that you slit your wrist and you ended up in hospital. Yeah. I always say to young people, before you sort of make that kind of decision again, it's always worth just giving us a call back at Childline. Because one will talk to you about how you're feeling at, at that particular moment. And sometimes it's just having a holding conversation with someone can, you know, help us keep it together until the next day. Every 12 months, more than 100,000 children call Childline for advice. Its counsellors, who are based all over the country, have been listening to a wide range of children's problems and helping to resolve them for the past 20 years. It has now, for the first time ever, allowed the BBC to film emergency calls as they come in. Would you like to speak to a counsellor here at Childline today? Hello, Childline switchboard. The greatest challenge facing its counsellors, most of whom are volunteers, is helping children who have been sexually abused and are often suicidal. If Childline hadn't been there, I'd have been dead. I would have committed suicide. And maybe people would have wondered why. I think I would have given up, to be honest. I don't think I would have... Um, I don't think I would have got my A-levels and I certainly wouldn't have gone to university because I needed something to make me fight and, and at times that, that wasn't there. I didn't expect Childline to help me. It was just the fact that someone was taking time to talk to me. Just, it was the first time I'd ever had that. Without Childline, I'd be dead. Hi, is there someone you can talk to? I think Childline has made a huge difference over the last 20 years. Firstly, of course, the fact that there is a, an anonymous but caring ear that the children can go to and speak to someone completely in confidence. I think the one thing uh, about a child who's been abused is, of course, the child is always told, don't tell. So it sounds like he's threatening to kill you if you tell someone. What do you think about that? Before Childline existed, the subject of child abuse was rarely talked about and written about even less. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, child abuse was notable by its absence in newspapers. Uh, many editors took the view uh, that it was so off-putting uh, for readers and probably so marginal uh, that they avoided, as far as possible, ever mentioning it, ever reporting on the odd stories that came up uh, and seeing it as uh, an activity which was never mainstream, uh, and a taboo, which, if you didn't talk about it, it never happened. The issue did reach centre stage when That's Life, presented by Esther Ranson, carried out a survey into the extent of cruelty to children. Many of you have told us your stories of the cruelty you've endured, and they're very painful stories to read. But we hope that from your experiences, we'll discover ways of protecting children in the future. We brought home to people for the first time that child abuse, particularly child sexual abuse, was something that was far more common than anyone had suspected, that it didn't just happen in, among the poor, among the drunk, that it could happen in any kind of home, anywhere, any income, no matter how respectable, these things happened. Esther Ranson and her BBC team were bombarded with calls from children seeking help. They suggested to existing charities that a helpline should be set up and were told it wouldn't work. They didn't listen. We can announce a brand new idea in this country, the launch of a national helpline for children in trouble or danger. It's free. It's called Childline. Somebody to talk to, speak the 
children in trouble or danger. Jo Oldbury was one of the first callers to Childline. She was 14. In order to tell her story for this film, she has asked for the help of her counsellor, Julie Crossan. This is the first time they have ever met. Hi. <coughs> jo Oldbury. Hi. Hello there. Oh, dear. It's lovely to meet you. Very nice to meet you too. I wish I could have given you a hug all those years ago. Child Line had only been going a few months when Joe got in touch to tell them she was being molested by a family friend. She says she had been scared into silence for more than six years by her abuser. They have some sort of power over you. Um, as a child, you're supposed to do as you're told and um, an abuser um, does have that power over you because they're able to do things to you or, or whatever. And um, by them saying that, that you won't be believed and also perhaps threatening that, that you'll be taken away, then as a child you become more frightened it was very hard for me. I was an only child, so I didn't have any siblings to talk to, and I didn't feel that I could talk to my parents. I knew that what was happening was wrong, and I knew that I needed help. And having seen the Childline adverts on the telly and Esther Ranson on That's Life, I felt that that was the best thing to do to get help. Hello, Childline switchboard. It's very strange. It's just very strange, really, speaking to somebody on the end of the telephone and telling them really sort of quite personal, personal things. Um, but I think she worked very hard to gain my trust um, because it was quite hard for me. She didn't rush me. Everything was done at my pace, at my speed. And um, if I didn't feel comfortable about talking about something, then we could go back to it. Childline um, referred me to the NSPCC and from that the school became involved and social services were involved as well. It seemed to happen so quickly from that moment. And your parents obviously became involved at that time as well? Yeah. My mum didn't really believe me. She just wanted to hide the fact that it was happening, brush it under the carpet. She didn't want anybody else involved. Jo was devastated when her mother ordered her not to cooperate with the authorities. I think it's important for, for children to be believed. Obviously, um, some children do lie about things, but it's a very serious problem. And um, as a child and an only, you know, as being the only child in a family, um, I, I wanted my mother to believe me because I was telling the truth. And for me, it was very hard not to be believed. Joe's allegations were never tested in court. If the case had gone ahead, the obstacles facing her would have been formidable. The legal system was geared towards disbelieving evidence by children that they'd been abused. This was based on a general idea that children were very rarely abused, and hence a story by a child that he or she had been was an incredible story and only with difficulty to be accepted. Um, there were corroboration rules which made it officially difficult for the court to believe what the child said. Uh, there was a competency requirement which was interpreted so as to make it almost impossible for the criminal courts to hear from children under the age of about eight. There was a hearsay rule which meant that the only vehicle by which the child's story could be put before the court was oral testimony 
given live by the child in the court in the presence of the defendant. Altogether, that made it difficult for the child's story to come before the court at all, and if it did come before the court, there was an official disposition to disbelieve it. Children were, quite frankly, frightened by the court experience, and they didn't have any support to go through the court experience. Uh, children were confronted face to face with the, the person they were accusing, which, uh, given the nature of the allegations, it's, it's frightening for, for a grown up, let alone for a child. Um, children faced long delays about actually even getting justice, uh, and that had a knock on effect for the sort of therapies and help that they were able to have whilst waiting for a trial. And most of all, I think they, they, they felt that the, the, the sort of natural cross-examination technique of, of, of aggression, accusing them of lying, was very, very threatening to a child. Hi, this is a counsellor at Childline. I know how difficult it is to make the first call. Sometimes it's just enough to make the call and not talk. Sometimes it's just enough to ring up and know that we're here. Hello. Hi. I'm just a bit worried about these tablets that you said you've taken. You've taken about 10 or 12. Quite a lot, that, and it's a, sort of enough for me to be worried. Can, can you describe? Can you tell me again the name of them? Can you spell it? Spell that. Yeah. We need to get her some help. Is there anyone else in the house with you? No. no. Where, where, are, where are your mum and dad now? For a 15-year-old to be drinking every day, that 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 is quite different. And so it just makes me wonder, you know, if there is a problem that went on that led to you drinking to this extent. I'm calling you because we've got a caller on the line at the moment who says that she's taken uh, 12 diazepam tablets in the last half an hour. I think because of, you know, these tablets that you've taken, you know, Chardland would really like to get you some help there, you know, get some deep round to your house and just check you out. Sounds about 14, 15. We've not got that detail right now. But how would you feel about telling us where you live? You don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. OK, so over 100 milligrams, she may be on, on, she may go unconscious and her breathing may be affected. You know, you, you could very well be in danger if you've taken 10 or 12 tablets. Many of the children who call about sexual abuse are concerned that being referred to the authorities will only make things worse. This is the, um, the phone box, which really? was originally round the corner Gosh. that I used to call you from. Gosh. Yeah. Little, uh, little but it was quite, well, it's quite good because it had smaller windows, you see. So it's not so obvious who's in there. Yeah. Yes. Oh, gosh. It's amazing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Where are we going? Jo's relationship with her mother never recovered after she was told to keep quiet. Three years later, her mother developed cancer. Jo nursed her through the last few months of her life. But they didn't resolve their differences before she died. People are always saying that as a child, if something's happening to you that is wrong, you should tell somebody because that's the right thing to do. And I did that. And it took a lot of courage for me to do that. But it, doing that stopped the abuse. But um, it doesn't mean that I was believed by my mum. I think the feelings really didn't come out until a later date after, after my mum had died. I had a lot of feelings of um, guilt. Um, but I also had feelings of, like, um, like my mum um, didn't really look after me as a child, and yet I looked after her um, when she needed my help. Mm, yes. Okay. 
And how old are you? Thirteen. Okay, so I was asking you a little bit about how things started with Mum's boyfriend. Mum was at work. I tried to tell Mum and she didn't believe you. She thinks you're saying it for attention. How do you feel about Mum sort of taking his word over yours? And what's Mum's boyfriend said to you about you telling her? Just thinking about what you've told me so far tonight. You've told me that, that Mum's boyfriend's been asking and trying to have sex with you. And that you're having to lock yourself in your bedroom at night to get away from him and that Mum's at work at night and that she, she knows what's going on but doesn't believe you. And that since you told Mum, boyfriend's, her boyfriend's been threatening to kill you if you tell anyone else. I mean, what, what you're saying to me, it sounds like you're not very safe at home. It's going to be, you know, quite a bombshell for for your mum. I mean, it's not it's something that you've had sort of four months to deal with, and you've been carrying it around you. Obviously, this is going to be the first time she's hearing of it, and not just worrying about you being pregnant and what you're going to do about that, but also about how it happened and what they're going to do about that. And you know, your mum might be very keen for you to talk to the police about what's happened or your dad might want to talk to this man, or there's all kinds of different scenarios of things that might happen. It's not really something that you can hide. If you were going to have a termination, you can sort of just walk back home again as though nothing had happened. So I think you ought to seriously consider talking to your mum about it from the beginning. OK? Well, you just did that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> This young person thinks that she's four months pregnant. Um, she says it's as a result of a rape by a family friend um, that was left in charge of her and her younger sisters. She hasn't felt able to tell her parents about what's happened. She hasn't spoken to anybody about what's happened. And essentially, she's just tried to wish the whole situation away. She's now at a point where um, her choices about what she wants to do about this pregnancy will be becoming more limited if she doesn't take some immediate action. So she's got two big things to worry about. So she's got this sexual abuse and this person being a family friend and still having access to her and her sisters. And then she's got a pregnancy that she doesn't want. 80% of the sexual abuse allegations Childline receives are against a relative or someone known to the child. But tackling abuse within the family has not been a political priority over the past 20 years. The subject is avoided by newspapers, even though it's far more common than attacks by strangers. The chief bogeyman idea is that there is somebody who's a recidivist pedophile. Uh, who is lurking within your community or may indeed be somebody who visits your community who is going to visit on your child uh, when they're out playing, when they're alone, when they're not under your care, uh, some terrible crime. Um, and uh, stories that have been largely published have been those rare occasions when this happens, let's know. Have no doubt that it does happen, but it is incredibly rare. Actually, if you're asking where are children likely to suffer abuse, the fact is they're likely to suffer abuse from people they know and quite often within the family. 
And yet, if you ask the average member of the public, they would probably think that children are more in danger from strangers. Uh, that that's not, not the truth. And um, education of the public, uh, discussion of these issues w would help, I think, to get that balance right. I think the great off-putting problem, as far as editors are concerned, about the idea of a paedophile being loose within the family is that it completely negates the consistent pushing of the family as being very important and, of course, goes against this idea of decrying the way families are supposed to have broken down. So anything which shores up the family is good. Anything which eats into it as a concept is bad. So the idea of there being uh, a lot of domestic abuse uh, is something that editors don't wish to countenance because how can they be preaching to people, stay within the family, it, it's bad that there's so much divorce, um, it's awful that there are single parents, how can they do that in the knowledge that at the same time a lot of, that, of the problems within families are caused by uh, bad behaviour from parents towards children? Several members of Jonathan's family subjected him to abuse when he was just a young child. He's asked us to protect his identity and change his name. My family treated children as though they were possessions, and children were there to have sex with adults. That's their purpose in life. Every adult I came into contact with was like that. I didn't go to the nursery school, so. I was surrounded by that all the time. Everything had to be earned. Nothing was for free. You know, it wasn't like I got meals or anything. It was if I wanted a meal, I had to have sex with the adult to get the meal. Everything was, this food is worth this much. You have to do this particular sex act to get that. So if I didn't have sex with the adult, I didn't get any food. I was getting more scared of what they were doing to me. It just, it got a bit worse as I got older because I was physically a bit bigger. They could do more damage to me and I could take it. I just wasn't coping. I didn't know what to do. It just felt like there was so much stuff in my head I was going to explode. I don't know what I wanted when I first called Jardline. I just, I was just scared. I couldn't talk to the woman really. Just found it really difficult to say anything. And she kept stopping and saying she just got to speak to somebody else. And she kept going silent. And every time she did that, I was thought she was calling the police. And I just I couldn't talk to her. So and I was convinced that he was going to find out. And then afterwards, when I put the phone down, I just I just couldn't believe my stupidity for trying to call them. And I just. I got really freaked out about it. They did eventually refer me to social service in the police without my consent, without my knowledge. It is Childline's policy to call in the police and social services if a counsellor thinks a child's life is at risk. You know, I still have nightmares about the medical examination I had with the police surgeon. It was like being abused again, you know, being put in a room with a guy I didn't know, being made to strip the world away, and, you know, for a reason they didn't explain to me. And then photographed. That was exactly what happened to me when my abusers were doing that to me. I mean, it wasn't any different. The person who was abused me was told that I'd called child on and what I'd called child on about. The social worker and the police officer took me home to his house and just told him what happened, and then they drove away. I couldn't trust anybody, and I couldn't ever tell anybody because he'd find out. And I just had to deal with it, cope with it. Every involvement I've had with criminal justice system has just made things a thousand times worse. They've always got away with it, and I've just been punished as a result of trying to get out of it. 
When his family discovered that Jonathan had been speaking to the authorities, he was tortured. It was two years before he picked up the phone again. I'd got to the stage where if my life carried on like that, I'd rather be dead. I'd run away, I'd be on the streets, I'd stake in drugs, I was self-harming, I was at the lowest point. And there was just questions in my head that were tormenting me. I didn't expect Childline to help me, but the person I spoke to was different. I was very aware, um, certainly in the early stages of talking to him, that if I were to say the wrong thing or respond in the wrong way, we could lose him and he might not phone back. If he'd said that he was going to have to refer me, then I would have put the phone down. There were times when I was incredibly angry that, that I really wanted this, particularly his main abuser, um, to have been brought to justice. But having said that, I recognise that it's not always possible, depending on how the young person feels. And one of the questions that I asked myself um, was if it was possible to bring a court case against that individual, um, what Jonathan would have to go through um, in order to try and secure a conviction, um, and who potentially would benefit from going through that process if I was, if I was pushing him to disclose to the police, um, is that going to be for his benefit in terms of getting some kind of justice or closure on what's happened to him because a conviction was, would by no means be a certainty? Or would I be doing it for me to make myself feel better, having heard all this stuff, um, that, that the person who did that w was going to pay for it? Um, and Jonathan's needs had to come before mine. Um, so sometimes you do have to put those feelings aside to be able to work with the young person in the way that they need you to work with them. As Jonathan did not want to take legal action, Charles encouraged him to escape his situation through education. He could see from talking to me that I had potential. And he was the first person to say, well done, for the stuff that I did, even if it was really small stuff. But I always had people saying, that's not good enough. You're not good enough. When I was supposed to be going to college and doing my assignments and all I wanted to do was take drugs, he was there saying, you know, it's not a disaster, it's one week and get back to it next week. And just the support through it, which I'd never had before, helped me stick to the course, even though bad stuff was still happening in my life and I was still a mess. He showed me that I couldn't let them win. They'd had enough for my life already. Jonathan's suspicion of the legal system is far from unique. But a number of changes have been introduced over the past 20 years to make it easier for children like him to take action against their abusers. There's been a number of campaigns, which some of which I've been involved in, to make the lawyers more aware of the effect of their questioning. Um, that's a twofold thing. Firstly, the judges have had more training about being more willing to intervene if they feel that the questions are going uh, too far. And also, barristers and solicitors are now much more aware that they have to treat children differently than they would adults when they're putting questions to them. One of the simple things that's happened, for example, is that if a child is asked questions in court now, quite often the lawyers will take off their wigs and gowns. We've seen the abolition of the rules about competency, which prevented young children being allowed to give evidence at all. We've seen an abolition of the corroboration rules, which used to ban any court convicting on the unsworn evidence of a child or children, and require the judge to warn the court that it was dangerous to believe even a sworn child giving evidence. And we've introduced the possibility of children uh, being video interviewed by trained people and the child's evidence in chief by which the child's account of the incident is put before the court 
is then routinely done by playing the videotape of the initial interview in less stressful circumstances and nearer the date when the incident took place. But these changes have not had a radical impact on the number of successful prosecutions. Many children remain deeply suspicious of a world run by adults who have failed to protect them. Jonathan was so traumatized by his experiences that he expected to be abused by every adult who got close to him. One of the things that Jonathan had been led to believe was that if adults were nice to him, if they spent time with him, if they listened to him, then ultimately he had to pay that back in the form of sex. And I think at the back of his mind throughout the time that we were talking, there was always the slight suspicion that at some point I would want to abuse him. Just because he was a counsellor, he's still a human being, he's still a man. Virtually all the men I'd come in contact with had hurt me. I'd, I'd never had an experience of working with somebody where they were expecting me to basically abuse them at some point. Um, and I think it really brought it home to me um, just how much he'd been affected by the things that his abusers had made him believe, how deeply ingrained they were. He just told me consistently and repeatedly that it wasn't going to happen until I started to believe it. If he said he was going to do something, he did it so that I could learn to trust him in other ways. With his counsellor's encouragement, Jonathan achieved a university degree. He says the three years support he received made this possible, but it also made him realise what he'd missed. It was really positive to have that, but in other ways it was devastating because I thought, well, why does it have to be someone doing their job, you know, that does that for me? Why, why couldn't I have had that before? Why is, it, why is someone getting paid to do that? give that to me, one to someone that gave birth to me or was paid to look after me didn't do that. What sort of things do you do to deal with it while you were severely depressed? So at the moment, you're not having any thoughts about harming yourself. I agree with you that you've, you've had a tough time growing up and you've had a, a lot of stuff happening for you. But I, I certainly would not agree with you that you're a bad person ever. A child pursuing legal action today still faces a number of obstacles. The most challenging of these is going to court where they will be attacked as a liar by a skilled barrister. It's stressful to have to um, dredge the incident out of the child's mind maybe ages afterwards, to relive it for the purpose of being cross-examined about it in court. It's stressful to go to court and deal with the strange surroundings of a court. Um, we temper this by allowing the child to have the cross-examination through a closed-circuit television link, which is certainly a help, and in many cases allows the child to be cross-examined usefully when otherwise the child would just clam up. But nevertheless, having to uh, come to court ages afterwards and then be cross-examined in this strange environment is something that children find stressful and difficult. Uh, there's still a, a little bit of a, of a courtroom lottery across the country uh, to the attitude that the individual judges may take about how child witnesses are take, taken in their courts, to the use of the video conferencing rooms. We could do with uh, more uniformity in relation to that and, and though there are guidelines, I think we can always look again at how they're operating in practice. The adversarial system is ridiculous quite inappropriate to get the truth of a situation surrounding children. Uh, children don't understand it. It's like some horrible game. Why is someone standing up on one side, someone standing up on the other? Why are they having this battle across the child? It's ridiculous. 
One of the victims of abuse who has secured justice over the past two decades is Maria del Medico. She was molested by her father up to the age of 14. Today, she and her boyfriend are returning to the house where the abuse took place. The street seems much, 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 much smaller. Like, there should be many more houses, you know? Yeah, yeah that was where the worst of it happened, you know? Yeah. When... That was when the worst of it happened. <laughs> you know, even when I screamed... <laughs> my father and my mother would take it in turns more or less to tuck us into bed at night and that's when it started. Now, it, it wasn't um, everything full on straight away. It was a grooming process. It was um, just a touch here, um, a word there, uh, without going into graphic detail. Uh, it was little and often. Um, I didn't like it. It didn't feel right. It felt wrong. Why can't I tell mummy? Maria's mother says she had no idea what was going on. He would go upstairs with Ria to put Ria to bed, and he'd be up there ages. And um, he'd come back down, and I'd say, what have you been doing? And he'd be saying, oh, I've been talking to Ria. And I used to think he was being a good father. My father used every trick in the book. He threatened to kill me. He threatened, he said, if you did tell anybody, they wouldn't believe you. And you'll be a lying little bastard, a lying little shit. He would get right close to me. I remember him in one particular occasion in Beaufort Road coming right into my face for no reason whatsoever, none, and saying, you know, I can kill you. I mean, I wouldn't wash. I didn't like to wash. I would defecate in my room. I would wet the bed. I would do anything as a self-defense mechanism to stop my father from hurting me. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes it didn't. But that's all I had. I mean, I'm a I was a kid. I should have known. I should have seen that something was going on. I should have protected my daughter. Um, I uh, also maybe I thought that had I been more res responsive to him, more sexually responsive to him, that he would have left her alone. I hated her. She knew what was happening. In my child's mind, she knew what was happening. Of course she didn't. I know that now because I'm a grown-up. But um, she knew what was happening and let it happen. She didn't. That's the point. She didn't. There was one occasion, I remember, that she was 12 and she was sat in the rubbish bin. And she said that she was sat in the rubbish bin because she was rubbish. Maria's father used to take her to the centre of Gloucester to buy pornography from a builder. That builder's name was Fred West. The house where he killed and buried nine children has been demolished and replaced with an alleyway. This is it. This is it. This is the place. Doesn't this feel weird? Because I know what happened here. You, you said you came into the house? Yeah. It would have been a, I can't remember. It would have been about here and the smell, it's body odour. I have this um, memory of seeing a few of the uh, Fred and Rose's children, Stephen, um, two girls, and Heather West, the, the one that um, they murdered, uh, was the same age as me. But I thought all of this was normal when I grew up. I thought this was normal. It's when you get older and you see other people talk to other people that you realise that, um, that it wasn't, that it isn't, and that it was wrong. And then you have the pain of that. With no one else to turn to, Maria decided to call Childline. They put her in touch with a local support group, 
which helped her to survive the next few years. If Childline hadn't been there, I'd have been dead. I would have committed suicide. And maybe people would have wondered why. So I wouldn't have left any reason. I'd have just done it. And people would say, oh, Maria, she was the crazy one. No. It was very important. Really believe in Childline, really. I mean, it works. It really does work. Maria's parents separated when she was in her teens, but she still didn't tell her mother what had happened. The abuse only came to light when Maria refused to go and spend Christmas with her father. She said to me, no, she said, I don't want to go, not after what he's done. And whether it was the way she said it or because I said to her, I said, what do you mean? And she was still looking at me very pointedly. And I said to her, has he touched you? And she said, not since I was 14, but for as long as I can remember before then. And she went, oh my God. I was speechless, actually. And I don't think I reacted quite as Maria wanted me to react. Principally, I think, because I went into shock. She believed me, straight away, she believed me, uh, which was important. I knew it was true. Um, there were certain things that she told me, personal things, that um, there's no way she could have known. And I believed it. It's like I said when she told me, it was like pennies dropped. You know, I kept thinking, well, that's why. I, I, I felt really stupid, you know, because it's there, it's in front of you, but you just don't, you don't think that this, this man that you love, this, the father of your children is, is capable of doing something so horrendous. It can take years before abused children are ready to confront their attacker. Even then, Childline advises them to prepare carefully before pressing charges. You really do have to spend like the next year getting yourself to a point of strength and sure of who you are and confident about who you are so that when you do face him and you do challenge him, you know, he can't take you back to being a 10-year-old who's powerless to stop whatever it is that he's doing. So please, even if you bump into him in Sainsbury's next week, you know, my advice would be to walk away because I think it would do more damage to you now. Maria attended the support group Childline had put her in touch with for several years before she was ready to take legal action. She finally went to the police at the age of 25 when they were excavating Fred West's back garden in Cromwell Street. Her mother was devastated. She just said to me, um, I've been to the police station and I've made a statement about Dad. And I just cried. I cried and cried. I made the most awful noises. I know I did. She didn't want me to go. She did not want it. She said, think of your brother. I went, no, I'm thinking of myself. Um, I, it's the only time I've turned around to my mother and said, bollocks, no, absolutely not. She was impassionate, she was banging the floor, she was crying her eyes out, screaming, please don't do it, uh, what will everybody think? I don't care, I don't care, I need it. And I, I did, I needed that. I felt that Maria was going or felt that she was going to get some sort of um, solace from going, for going for prosecution. I felt that she was, she thought that if her father was prosecuted, then it was going to make everything okay for her. And I couldn't see that that was going to happen. I thought it was going to open up a can of worms. I was going to get a conviction because the alternative was I was going to go out and get him. Um, and I, I promise you, I would have gone out and get, got him. If he did not get a conviction, I would have got him. Sometimes I wish I had. <laughs> I 
He was charged initially with rape and lewd and libidinous conduct and gross indecency and five charges altogether, but he copped a deal. He said, pled guilty to the four lesser charges, but if he had pled guilty to the rape, and I promise you, you put anybody in that jury and I will make them come back with a guilty verdict. That man raped me when I was seven years old. That's unforgivable. You know, forget the fact he's my father. You know, I'm a kid. And it's affected me. Yeah. Oh, for God's sake, I'm getting so bloody mad. Don't worry, just take a minute. I'm sorry. Despite the changes in the law over the past 20 years, the vast majority of abuse cases that come to Childline's attention never reach court. The law is still a blunt instrument. It still damages children. There are still children who deserve justice and don't get it. And I think the Home Secretary ought to look at that as a priority, ought to set up a proper commission of inquiry to look at the way we deliver justice and the way we fail to deliver justice to the children who need it most. In the end, we must make sure that the accused has a fair trial and the, the advocate has a responsibility to uh, explore the evidence properly and fairly. But there's a difference between a proper and fair cross-examination and one that is bullying and intimidating. And uh, there's definitely a lot we can do to ensure that we have the former, not the latter. Basically, what we need to do is carefully interview a child when a child discloses abuse, find the corroborating evidence, and then show that to the court. In other courts around the world, children never have to appear in court. What are we doing? I think the problem is, because it works for adults, or usually works for adults. We think it works for children, but it simply doesn't. Mm -hmm. You okay? Mm. 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 Are you sure you're all right? Yeah. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. I love you. <laughs>